With regards to the grace of thy Holy Spirit upon us and open the eyes of our hearts and our minds to thy gospel for thou art a good and merciful of men we God. Uh, I came to the 17th chapter of Matthew's gospel now and uh, we were talking in, in the last chapter 16 the uh, rich man and, and, and Lazarus as it's a parable. Some people rather foolishly try to make some doctrine out of it. Say Mark of Ephesus warns us not to because it's only a parable. But we see that in, in the parable, the, the rich man, of course, had everything. He feasted sumptuously and had uh, very soft clothing and lived a fairly soft life. And Lazarus sat outside the gate of his place and begged all the time. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's evident that the rich man didn't do anything for, for the poor beggar, that he kind of ignored him. And uh, the dogs, it seems, have more compassion. Uh, it doesn't tell us that the rich man wasn't a faithful Jew. It tells us that he was callous and indifferent to other human beings, in, in the story anyway. And when they depart this life, there's, there's a chasm between them, a great gulf between the two. And <clears throat> really, this, this indicates a great separation that they could communicate across the gap, but they couldn't cross it. So they were in the same place, essentially. And of course, that's precisely how we understand the meaning of the river of fire, is that heaven and hell are the same place. It just depends on how our conscience and our mind perceive them. And uh, the real point, ultimate point of the story, where the rich man says to uh, Abraham, well, at least let uh, Lazarus dip his finger in water and touch my tongue to cool it. And in the end, we're told, even if someone rises from the dead, they won't believe him. But the rich man says, well, send Lazarus to tell my brothers to warn them so that they wouldn't come into this place. Now, even if someone rises from the dead, they won't believe him. And of course, here Christ is talking about himself and the resurrection. And uh, how if he rises from the dead, they still won't listen to him. They, they, they have the law, they have the prophets, they didn't listen to them. Now they're not going to listen to Christ even after he rises from the dead. So uh, that's kind of the closing of, of that chapter. St. Mark of Ephesus tells us that, well, it's only a parable and we can't make any, any doctrine out of it. The Latins had used it somehow to, to twist it into something of, pur of purgatory. And uh, the main thing is that that separation is what hell really consists in. And the fire that burns us, of course, is, as, as uh, we're told by the Holy Father's bitter regret. And now we go into chapter 17. And uh, Christ starts off by saying it's impossible that stumbling blocks won't be formed, that some people will be made to stumble by other people. And <clears throat> this could be understood as some serious matter where you cause a lot of people to stumble and fall. But we need to think, let's bring it down a little bit more to our own level. Uh, we do cause other people to stumble and fall sometimes by the way we treat them and by the way we behave amongst ourselves. And when, when people, especially children or young people, see us behaving badly to each other in the church, um, then we've become a stumbling block to them because they're, they're, they're just humans and they're children and they'll judge the church by us and the way we behave in it. You know, we had a couple of Romanian uh, kids who said, well, they would never go to St. Nicholas Parish anymore. They'd come to the monastery, but they wouldn't go to St. Nicholas. And I asked one of them why. He said, because I understand Romanian. And uh, he was rather scandalized at, at the way the Romanians talked about each other when they were different tables. And uh, that formed a stumbling block to, to both the boys. So they preferred to come to the monastery when there was something, but they wouldn't go to St. Nicholas. And uh, that's, um, that was 
the way we, we, we form a stumbling block like that to young people because we teach one thing and do another. But a lot of Christians form a stumbling block to a lot of people. And we do it mostly through our really our hypocrisy, the way we the way we talk and act. It, it's so different from, from what Christ taught us that uh, we are a stumbling block to others. And that's it's not just some big scandal like when a, a priest embezzled uh, you know several thousand dollars from the parish, of course that's a stumbling block. But it's the little things we do. And the little arguments and fights we have where other people can see us, especially young people. Uh, that, that always forms a stumbling block to them. And so we, we hear these words of Christ and we think, well, this is something you know, big. I would never do anything like that because it's talking about some big scandal or something. No, it isn't. It's talking about the little, the, well, it's talking about the scandals that we create ourselves amongst ourselves by our petty pettiness and uh, by being offended too easily and by arguments and by fights and by gossip and things like that, they form a clear and definite stumbling block to younger generation. But um, anyway, Christ tells us it would be better if we have a millstone tied around our neck and we're cast into the sea than to be a stumbling block to one of these little ones. So we need to take thought about this and think about just what it does mean. And sometimes while we're judging that person as a stumbling block because we've actually become the stumbling block by making a loud judgment about somebody else and condemning them. Then we've become the stumbling block, not them. So sometimes this is what happens. It's so easy to say, them, they, those. But very seldom we say, well, perhaps me. And uh, that's where we need to think about it and try to correct ourselves accordingly. And the other thing that Christ says in here is a little bit startling, if you think about it, if your brother or sister sins against you, uh, rebuke them. Uh, if, they, if they apologize or repent, uh, really apologize, then of course you must forgive them. But he says, if your brother or sister, if they sin against you seven times a day, and seven times a day apologize, then he says, you shall forgive them. He doesn't say you should, but you shall forgive them. That's an imperative. Christ is demanding of us that we forgive them, no matter what. And as hard as difficult as that is to do, it we bring the ability through practice of doing it. And uh, so it, it's something that we have to think about and contemplate a little bit, uh, because uh, it's it's really the Christian. I mean, if we talk about the Christian way to be instead of the Christian way to be. Uh, you know, too many Christians are moralistic. They're looking at everybody else's, uh, what they perceive to be everybody else's morality or lack of it, but they're not looking at themselves and the way their accusations of other people cause a definite stumbling block to other people. And so we have to be very, very careful at uh, not looking at ourselves, but looking always at other people to, uh, because we, you know, we gossip, we slander other people, we say things. Other people hear us saying those things and they think, well, my goodness, they're supposed to be Christians, so listen to that. And then they say, well, if that's Christianity, I don't want any part of it. And the same happens with our young people. They say, well, if that's Christianity, why bother? So we become a stumbling block and we better if we were drowned in the sea. The other uh, part of this, it's really the story more than a parable almost, that if uh, if a person has a slave, now if, of course in those days there were slaves, there weren't servants, there were slaves. Uh, they were kind of owned and um, very often when Paul refers to himself as a slave of God, the, the word servant isn't used, the word slave is used. And uh, so if, if, if uh, your, your slave comes in, from working in the field, so you tell him he has to serve your meal before he eats, and he does that. And the master isn't going to thank him for doing it because he only did what he was commanded to do. And really the point here is that uh, if we do only what we're commanded to do, just to follow commandments, 
then it's, it doesn't have any particular value to us. We do more than we're commanded to do. If we go the extra distance for somebody, that's when it has real value. And to do only what we have to do or what we're required to do isn't enough. That we do more than that. That we give from our... See, the king offered his sacrifice because he had to, and like he offered it according to the rules. But Abel's sacrifice was accepted because his, he did more than he was required to do because he offered from the heart. And Cain didn't offer from the heart. So when we do something and we do it from the heart, it has real moral value and it has real spiritual value. When we fulfill something just because it's the rule or the regulation or because we're commanded to do it, then, well, it's fine. It keeps us from getting into trouble for not doing it. But it doesn't add anything to us. It doesn't have any real moral value. It's merely compliance. And it doesn't show any kind of love or compassion. So to go beyond what's required of us and uh, you know, do, do something extra for somebody. The other part of the, the next part of the story, of course, is about the ten lepers. And this ties together with the first one, that ten lepers, uh, while Christ was crossing through Samaria, ten lepers came, came and asked for healing. And Christ heals them, and they, they, they went their way. As they were going, they were healed. And one of them, only one of them, turned around and ran back to, give, to thank Christ for it. And uh, he was not a Jew, but a Samaritan. And whether it's meant as a parable or an actual story, uh, I think it's fairly clear that what, when we uh, receive from someone and really have no gratitude at all, uh, then it, it, it's a sin against that person and a sin against, against God and against yourself in it. That what we receive, we, we need to express our gratitude for. Uh, in this case, to express gratitude that God has healed the man and uh, that he really felt deep within himself that uh, a, a deep sense of, of cleansing and his personality was such that it was cleansed as well and he turned and returned to give thanks to God. That's uh, the main part of, of the story, those things that we've touched. Not only to go back and, and say, I repent that I, that I sinned against you, but to go back and thank the person for something they, that they actually did for you. It builds a, a, a sense and feeling of well, not only uh, gratitude but well-being, and it also makes a bond between people. That when you express your gratitude to people, it does form a, a relationship. And it's a relationship of appreciation. And that kind of relationship, relationship can grow and develop into something very good. But uh, too often to ignore what's been done for one and just go about one's business as if they've received nothing. And this particular incident uh, about Christ is, in a way, <coughs> talking about the Messiah who's come to save the world, beginning with the holy nation. And no matter what he does, there's no gratitude being shown. No gratitude being shown toward God who's done so much for the holy nation. And uh, soon the holy nation is going to cease to exist. It's going to be crushed and Jerusalem burned and everyone driven out. But in the meantime, this one non-Jew has come back to give thanks to Christ. And we see this several times in the Gospel where it's the non-Jew who becomes a faithful one and where the uh, children can be cast out but, and not come into the wedding feast, but they'll find people from among the nations who will come into the wedding feast. So don't be too puffed up and pompous because you're Jews and you think that you have, you're part of the holy nation and think that God has some legal obligation to you. No, you have to respond to him and fulfill his will. And if you reject what he's done and what he's given, there will be others from other nations who will come in and take their place in the bosom of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So <clears throat> this is uh, as far as I want to go with it today because we'll ask if anybody has any questions, even going back to 
rich man, Lazarus is a rich man. I, I do think it's significant that in Dostoevsky's um, Crime and Punishment, when Sonia wants to open the heart of Raskolnikov, remember he's going to prison now for murder, so he's going to ultimately be sent to Siberia. Uh, she marks the place in the scripture where it is the raising of Lazarus. And when finally in Siberia, Rodion reads this section of the scripture about the raising of Lazarus, and something happens within him. And at that moment, he seems to be illumined. He, he receives the grace of the Spirit. And uh, then he totally repents. And with repentance, he becomes a completely new person in the story. But the raising of Lazarus seems to be this dominant uh, thing that Sonia wanted to convey to him. And we're never quite sure why that, uh, that, that, that it was that particular story in it. So, somehow this idea of being dead and raised again, Amos Kolnikov being spiritually dead, and then raised uh, to an actual spiritual life so he can live and, and, um, and thrive and accomplish something positive in his life. So that's uh, just an interesting point. So anybody have anything for discussion? Uh, is there any, anything that's not clear in, the, in this part of the scripture? But uh, some of it sometimes seems not to be. And uh, if you have any questions, then bring them and ask them. Uh, can we accomplish anything? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a message that's repeated over and over again, and yet we as Christian people have so much trouble accepting it. If your brother sins against you seven times in a day, if he says he's sorry seven times in a day, you have to forgive him. He doesn't say you should forgive him, but you shall forgive him. And really, that, that's so important for us. And, I, you know, I, I mean, I know some of our people well enough to know, uh, you know, among some of our Russians, we have, in Edmonton, we had pre-revolutionary Russians. I mean, they were the old stock. Mm -hmm. And very often they would, get together at dinner and then some of them were never ever going to speak to each other again. Never. Never. This is unforgivable. And of course next week they'd be having supper together again and everything would be just fine. You know. <laughs> I think Greeks are a little bit like that. Uh, you know, the first time I went to Greece it was in an election, in the period of an election. And you have to be in Greece when they're having an election because you go to Syntagma or something into the subway and you think, oh my gosh, they're having a gang fight down here. They're, they're rioting. And actually, they're not. They're just arguing politics. So if the <laughs> Greeks argue, it's a little of something to behold. <laughs> I remember going in that same year. I went into the uh, South Mosque for Larissa, the train station for Larissa. There was some ancient old woman arguing and arguing and yelling at the, the wicket at the person selling the tickets. And pretty soon, uh, it seemed like everybody in the train station chose sides and they were all arguing on one side or the other. Okay. And finally, uh, the, the, uh, my friend had gone to buy tickets for his came back and I said, what's going on? He said, oh, she took the train to Larissa 25 years ago and she remembers what the fare is and he's trying to charge her more. And she says he's trying to cheat her because that's not what the fare is. <laughs> <laughs> But, but everybody in the train station chose sides and one guard, you know. It's just, it was so popular. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I guess then. Oh, yes ma'am. I just want to say thank you for perspective on Dostoevsky. Mm. Because like I studied it in high school mm. and didn't understand anything. And I now I'm so surprised how we could learn and people teach Dostoevsky, like from literary critical point of view, but you cannot understand him without orthodox Christian. No, yeah. you, you know, you have to it's see why, reason. you have to see the, the very reason that he converted when he was in Siberia. And he says that it, he, he was so moved by seeing that people in their great suffering and distress could still care about other people who are suffering, but still try to comfort other people who are suffering. 
And he said, really, he understood from that the meaning of all suffering love that he heard. The people who are suffering the same way truly understand each other's suffering. And, you know, the word passion again means suffering. That's why we say compassion and together with suffering. That really, compassion means to suffer or suffer. And uh, all suffer means to try to understand and grasp the other person's suffering instead of, uh, to, because it can be healing. And I think years and years ago, in Chola, probably four decades ago, <laughs> uh, there was a, a woman in her, oh, she was probably over 40, and she had long hair that she kept bleaching blonde, and she rode around on a bicycle quite a bit, and um, it's nice to ride your bike. But she was always trying to pick up teenage boys. And a lot of people were full of judgment and condemnation about it, but I thought, well, wait a minute. I don't think judging and condemning, because she has some kind of inner suffering going on with it. And that's the problem with moralism. You know, you judge and condemn people without ever thinking about what kind of internal suffering they're going through. Without the, you know, the mental suffering and, and everything that they're going through that, that produces this kind of behavior. And that's one thing that Dostoevsky was keenly aware of. Is, um, and and St. Anthony Kropovitsky, in his commentaries on Dostoevsky, said that, that this is a theme throughout Dostoevsky, that the power of co-suffering love is the only power we have that might serve for the spiritual regeneration of another person. That, can you imagine, though, you're going to try to spiritually heal or help a person find spiritual regeneration, so you, you start off by saying, you know, oh, you're a filthy, shameless sinner, and, and cursing them and telling them all the things that are wrong with them, and then you expect them to listen to you in some way, instead of trying to understand the suffering the person is going through themselves in it. And that's so often the case with the people we judge. We never stop to think what kind of mental, emotional suffering they're going through, and we're judging them because of their suffering, really. So that's a part of uh, what's critical for us. Sorry, the question. So how, when George, George Swarovski wrote about uh, 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 Arch um, Archimandrit Antoni, yeah. he criticized him in his book, Ways of Russian Orth Orthodo Orthodoxy mm -hmm. or yeah. Theology. Yeah. So how do you think, how, how, you, how you perceive this critic of Swarovski? Well, I, I, towards yeah. Antoni, he said, Florovsky said, it's too Western way to to make psychology from, you, you know the point. Oh, yeah, Florovsky. yeah, I, I do. You know, Metropolitan Anthony, uh, along with Vatkovsky and uh, several others, were struggling against the Western scholasticism in the seminary and, the, and in the system. But um, in some cases, they didn't quite make it themselves. <laughs> but that, that's, yeah, they were in the midst of struggling about it. Florovsky also at a uh, conference in Thessaloniki, one of the Greeks said, uh, Russia never produced a church father. And he said, well, yes, we did. We have Metropolitan, we had Anthony Kropovitsky. <laughs> but uh, in, in, in trying to, I think in Metropolitan Anthony's own confession and a few other things, he was using, um, developments that have taken place in psychology. And perhaps Swarovski didn't like some of the Western um, psychology, but then psychology was something rather new. And um, I, I think Metropolitan Anthony had uh, a lot of profound insights. Uh, everybody, you know, he has some weaknesses and sometimes put their profoundly. He was a Judeophobic, mm -hmm. even though he denied it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he really was. And, um, but not, not to the extent that um, um, John Kronstadt. Uh, St. John Kronstadt was, was actually had a, a smoldering hatred of Jews. And he actually provoked some outrages against the Jews. You know, he was really, really very anti-Semitic. 
friends are Jewish. I, I don't like the term anti-Semitic because the Arabs are Semites mm -hmm. as well. They, they came from the same stock. So to say anti-Semitic means you don't like Arabs or Jews. But in any case, uh, th that was something that happened in that period of time. You know, Metropolitan Redeemer of Moscow, uh, just not long before the revolution, was so virulent against Jews that they finally had to relieve him from the Moscow Cathedral mm -hmm. and uh, tell him to, to, to silence him. Eventually he was sent to uh, Kiev after Metropolitan Anthony was in exile. And course, a lot of people say, well, Metropolitan Vladimir of Kiev was one of the first martyrs to the Soviets, but I'm not too sure if it was really martyrdom or he was tried for the uh, outrages of pogroms that he caused against the Jews, one or the other. But uh, so there, there were weaknesses amongst all these people. Uh, I, I've heard people criticize Florovsky for being too Western or too Latin. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, 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 I think sometimes that Florovsky just belonged to his age. I compare him with Arzam, a Russian, mm -hmm. like so, sociologist, like Peter M. Sorokin, yeah. who was very military, aggressive towards other researchers. Mm -hmm. But I think it was spirit of time. Yeah. Well, yes, of course, he it was, it was, was that, too, that particular too sharp, part, you know. And then there was so much to, you know, in the St. Vladimir, where St. Uh, Serge was founded, um, I mean, look who were teaching there. Gadinsky, for instance, was an atheist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was teaching there. And, uh, of course, Berdyaev and the uh, Bulgakov of China. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, th there were so many people teaching there, some of whom were just outright atheists, you know. So, you know, there, were, there was a real conflict, and, and the conflict between uh, Florovsky and um, mm -hmm. Bulgakov was very intense. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things were very intense there. Yeah. But anyway, that's, uh, we'll talk about those mm -hmm. after. We can shut us off.